Red? Oh. <laughs> I got a red one. <laughs> All right. I thought all the terms like red things. Tom, I've got a pipe. I've got one in here too. I'm kind of red line documents. Anybody else? I thought that was. Everybody else good? Okay. I do for edit. And I use red pen. You do what? I do for edit. Session agenda, and uh, I will entertain the approval of the agenda. So mm -hmm. needed. Quick question, Matt, on the agenda, and I don't know if this is, but I thought we were going to discuss the wing elementary as well. It is. Is it on there somewhere? Yes, yes down, uh, Kyle, on uh, number. What session are we Number 11. This is work number 11. Now. Naming of new oh, elementary okay. facility. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Thank you. You. I have a motion for the approval of the work session. Second. Any further discussion or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, no public comments, so I guess I'll entertain a motion to adjourn out of uh, work sessions. To move to Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. And now I will call to order the uh, Tuesday, June 13th, 2017 monthly uh, board meeting. Uh, and I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. I, I need to make a motion on that first. I want something moved off of the uh, consent, consent agenda, please. Policy G, B, L, and J, O. Can we put those to requiring action? Which, hold on a second, Heather. Which one? J, O. J, O, and G, B, L. Okay. GBL? GBL and JL. I'll go separately. Please. So is that your motion to yes. set to I'll second that. Okay. Motion and a second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So you want those, you said requiring accident, what you said? Yes. Yeah, I just moved them. I moved them down to the very last 13 and 14, I guess, or 14, 15. 15. Yeah. And I need to Okay. Okay, the first item of business under informational is that of the career ladder report, and Ms. Hallfield is going to. Uh, present that information. Uh, basically, in your packet, you have all the numbers there. I'm just going to touch on a few highlights. Um, if you'll see there, we had a total this year paid out cost to the district of three hundred twenty-one thousand seven hundred and fifty, and one hundred and sixty-two teachers that were uh, participants in our career ladder. Uh, look at your hours. A couple things I want to point out: your student contact. 7,393 and a half hours. That's just extra outside of contract a day contact with our students. So I think that, that is pretty telling of the importance of this, this program that we have. So uh, then as, as you can see there, the hours, the curriculum development, there were 1,700, a little over 1,700 outside of contracted hours. We'll make sure you understand that means outside of their school day. None of that can be counted in their contract today so that's everything done outside of that which is on their own time basically um, working on professional development 2332.25 working on instructional strategies 1128 we added last year beautification hopefully if you've driven around our campuses you notice that they do look much better and so that's uh, 273 hours there and then we had 30 that counted hours towards master's degree and in the bottom, this is going to be our estimations for next year. As far as where our people will move, 
we'll have 26 at stage one, 47 stage two, and 121 at stage three for a total of 194. Total cost to the district for next year, as far as estimate, is 392,000. Anybody have any questions? The one question that I have, I don't know if you can answer it. I think the number that that didn't participate is relatively low, but do you know why the two chose not to participate for that? There were a couple that that uh, chose not to just because we had one that had a long-term illness that was they were unable. Uh, they were unable to, they just weren't here to really to fulfill their their requirements. Uh, so they just chose not to. We had one long-term illness. We did have one that was out for quite a while, but she got back in time and, and uh, ended up getting her to turn in before the deadline. So uh, other than that, I can't really speak to why someone would choose not to, really. I, I was just curious. Uh, but we still just pay in half. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, this is our portion, but that's half. But no, this is all the district now. I know, but what I'm saying, we were paying that used to the state pay. Yeah, yes, 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 that's yeah. right. Yeah. But we have the cost, right? So the cost of the district is still the same. Am I not right? Right, right. right. Yeah. They, they used I mean, to be able to make money twice, yeah, they used to do, yeah. have to do twice the number twice of hours, oh. make and twice the money. money. Okay. And we just took on our half and cut the hours back, wrote our own plan, basically. Okay. Right. When the state would fund it. That makes sense to you. Let me do it. Oh yeah, no, that's absolutely yeah. Okay. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, next is the wellness program report, Ms. Boardman. Um, as the board members are aware, earlier in the month you adopted a new policy that came out that had to be adopted by July one. It was policy ADF. As part of that policy, we adopted as our official guidelines for wellness um, smart snacks. Uh, which is what we had complied with um, in the last, I believe we've used that for the last three years. There are some changes this year. There's a big focus now. Our wellness, when we bring our actual procedure to you at some point during this next school year, has to be a section on nutrition education, physical ed education, uh, proof that we're doing activity breaks, uh, which we're doing those. We just have to have a written plan. And then we, uh, the wellness committee is a little bit more involved um, on who we need to invite to attend. So uh, Hugh and I and Nika will all be working on that next year. And as board members, you all are invited to be on that committee. Uh, it probably will meet about three times next year, and, and you'll be noticed when we get those meetings set up. But um, the USDA really encourages board members to participate in that wellness committee. Um, the wellness, the, the SMART guidelines, the SMART snack guidelines are applicable 30 minutes before school and 30 minutes after the end of school. And the big change in this that's not going to be popular is that before we were only limited to whatever we sold during that time period, 30 minutes before, during the day, and 30 minutes after. So if we weren't selling it, it didn't have to comply with the nutrition guidelines. And now anything has to. So if you're a parent and you want to bring in snacks for a birthday party, you have to be compliant with Smart Snacks. Now, how we're going to police that, I'm not sure. Uh, so why would we police it? So you uh, know that. Well, probably because we get two million dollars from the USDA every year. <laughs> so we at least need to have a good plan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that we are allowed um, exempt five fundraisers for the year so we can get around some of that that it's this fundraiser um, so anyway we're going to work with staff there is one thing we can do for birthday celebrations um, that are compliant with smart stacks where you would just do one monthly event um, luckily they did take out because i was really concerned about this they did take out this is not applicable to our uh, fax classes our home ec classes so what, the, what they prepare and serve um, at the junior high or at SC, I was really worried about culinary arts. It's not applicable. They went back at the last minute and took that line out. Uh, it still affects school stores, vending machines, and our fundraisers. We were already used to that. So the big change is going to be the, the party snacks and also any rewards that teachers do. So, you know, if you give a Starburst out because they did good on something, it's we're out of compliance if we do that. So we'll work with administration, see what our practices are, and we'll spend the next year banding a procedure. So. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. 
Thank you, Lord. Next, we have the standard based grading update. Mr. Mays is going to give that information. Yes, sir. In 2007, we started the district working on standards based grading, we at least exploring the, the, uh, the advantages of that, the possibility of doing that. And then in 2012, uh, the elementary principals and I decided that extending standards based grading to first grade would be helpful in improving academic achievement. So we made that change for the 12 13 school year, and uh, I thought that was a good move on our part. Uh, at that time, there was quite a bit of discussion about moving standards-based grading forward each year as the students would advance mm -hmm. so that the kids that were in first grade in 12, 13, and 13, 14, and second grade, they would have standards-based grading, etc. as they went forward. <coughs> and at, the at the time, uh, I argued against that plan because I felt so, but doing so would have us moving the program forward before we really felt like we had it uh, the way we wanted it. We wanted to make sure that we had all the revisions done and it was the way we wanted it before we moved it forward. Also at that time, we had some parent meetings and parents voiced the opinion that they did not want to see standards based grading move forward, you know, one year at a time. So that the same group of kids were always being introduced, their teachers were always being introduced to standards based grading. The comment was, we don't want our kids to be guinea pigs. And so, you know, we found a comment around that. I promised them that we would not just move it forward one year at a time, and so we didn't. Uh, toward the end, though, of the 15-16 school year, we felt that our revisions and work with standards-based grading had progressed to the point that we would consider moving a standards-based grade to the second grade. And so during the past school year, actually, not only this past school year, teacher representatives, instructional coaches, and principals have worked to look at standards-based grading. We've looked at what the report card descriptors would be if we moved it forward, and uh, done quite a bit of work with the LA and math. <coughs> Excuse me. Meetings have also been held with teachers to review this information, and we've also had parent meetings at each elementary school. Uh, all parents attending the meetings were supportive of the expansion of standards-based grading to second grade. It was kind of funny, I told Mr. Williams, we had a, a common question asked at all three of the meetings, and the parents said, I, well, I had one parent, Matthew, say it well. She said, uh, based on this change, that we would have standards-based grading in kindergarten, at first grade, and second grade. She said, so when my, parent, my child goes to third grade, when I ask the teacher, how's my child doing, I don't want to hear he's doing fine. I want to hear what I've been used to hearing for the past three years, and that is detailed information what they can and can't do. And that was pretty uniform uh, at Lee Hunter Matthews in Southeast. It kind of surprised me. I didn't expect uh, that to be the question. So that's the biggest concern the parents had, and I assure them we work on that. Um, anyway, based on that, we've, we've met with teachers. Uh, we've done a lot of work toward that and uh, met with parents. And based on that, I talked to Mr. Williams. And so I thought it was time to inform the board that was our intent, was to move standards-based grading to a second grade next year. Do you have any questions? Can you, for those that are new, mm -hmm. help us understand you know what? standards-based I meant to do that. Standards-based grading is essentially what we're doing in kindergarten, where you have a list of, of, I would call them descriptors, but you could call them objectives if you want to, of what you want the students to, to be able to do in the kindergarten. Um, and I believe kindergartens are broken down by quarter, too. I'm not sure if they are or not, to be honest with you. Uh, first grade and second grade will be broken down by quarter. And then instead of just giving an A, B, C, or D, or F, um, the students are ranked whether they meet, are progressing, or don't meet those skills. And then those, that information is shared with parents. And the thought is, is that by giving the parents more detailed information, and by the teachers keeping records on how the students are doing, we can better address their needs. For example, if you call the teacher and say, no, how's my second grader doing in, in reading? And they say, well, he's got a B. That really doesn't tell you a whole lot. But if they tell you, well, he's really having trouble with his comprehension skills, he's having some problems with, with his sight words, then you get much more detailed information. Any other questions? Thank you. Next in your packet is the student discipline data as of May 2017. Uh, the roundup, I guess, for this, this past school year, we have the number of students that were in ISS, OSS, and then also the incidents broken down by building. Questions on those? Okay, board policy <coughs> consideration. We have several <coughs> policies that are for consideration this month. And Ms. Hallfield? Yes. And let me just say on the first one, for policy, BBFA, you've seen this a lot over the last several years. Some of you guys have been on the board. Simply because every two years we have to re-adopt this and then submit that to uh, Missouri Ethics Commission by September 15th. So 
Shannon, I just did the first That's good. I was going to say thank you. You want me to second? You fired me. I'll let you. Okay, uh, the next one is GDPD. Um, let's see if I can get my letters straight this time. Last week or last month, I had a little issue with my letters. Uh, this policy policy is revised to comply with, with House Bill 1432. Uh, basically, it's going to be a requirement for public employers, uh, like school districts, not just school districts, to provide employees placed on paid administrative leave due to misconduct, just certain rights. It's about their rights as to what they uh, will be a, <clears throat> given while they're on that paid leave. And if you scroll down, you can see in what's highlighted there, and that's, that's the changes and what they what they got there. So I'm not going to read through a bit of that for you. I think you all can do that. Uh, IGCE, district-sponsored instructional options. Um, this is just an update to a policy to reflect changes uh, from the graduation requirements for students in Missouri public schools. And again, you can see that there's a few highlighted areas under that addressing district-sponsored instruction options. I have a question, Shannon. Okay. On um, where it says um, <clears throat> under dual enrollment. Yes. And it's talking about the highlighted part about the post-secondary courses where you're duly enrolled. Mm -hmm. And it says that the courses in which students are duly enrolled may be counted as part of the district's curricular offerings only if the district pays the essential cost of tuition fees and books and provides transportation at no cost to students. Yes. Can you clarify that? It just that. <laughs> it just is what it is. Um, <laughs> do we have to adopt that? Well, well here, so we have to pay. So we're going to have to pay. Here, for here's the thing that I did. I went back to 2010 when this thing was originally adopted. And in that, it states the very same thing, basically at the top, let's see, uh, where is it at? We, we basically had this. Yeah, it talks about at the top, that first, it uh, talks about the, the district expense. This has been in, and we've been doing dual enrollment with SAHAC or SEMO Sykes now for not quite 10 years. As long as I've been here. And we have not been paying for that. Now we pay for the books, we but we haven't books. been paying for the tuition. We haven't been paying for any of that. Um, they dual enrollment when I was here. I mean, I took that was dual credit or dual credit. I'm dual sorry. credit is where the, the teacher on was campus. actually on campus, yeah. on the high school That's right. campus. That's right. That's right. This is on about those classes that are going this, to this is, be honest with you. This is a concern. This is a concern. Um, so we, we want we, our kids to take. Well, well, that's the way I'm reading it. Well, we don't have to if we don't adopt that language. But as it's written right yeah, now, written. then we're yes. going to have to pay for that. And yeah. let me just tell you, we've talked to some surrounding districts, because we're not the only I mean, school district. Uh, we talked with Seth, that he's, he's, our, he's our liaison out through SEMO, and he's not aware of any districts that do this, uh, as far as through SEMO, that, that pay for all this. So, so who's suggesting the language? I mean, where is it's, that coming from? It's coming from that graduation, graduation requirement course. as of 2015, apparently. In that booklet, the graduation requirement booklet is what Desi sends out. It's, it's what the high school administration will go through to make sure our kids are yeah. doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that was modified, apparently, in 2015, saying that if you want to count these kids, if kids want to get grades, both college credit grades and also high school credit grades, the district has to take care of that and pay for everything, even offering them transportation. Oh, that doesn't I will sense. tell you, I have called <laughs> I some other district to see how they're handling this. I've left a couple of messages. A lot of people aren't in session right now, but are even in their offices. But we've called, we've had counselors checking with some other districts too to kind of see. Because we're obviously not going to be the only district affected. Would you well, agree, Ms. Is it? Is it Legislative is yeah, this isn't Desi saying sitting around in a committee? This is not a, a law or a statute from what I'm from what I'm understanding. It's a graduation requirement though, right? It is part of what Desi says. In order for us to count that as a college credit grade and a high school grade, which we want. Which is what we did. I mean, you know, you take out the math grade. So I, I would feel very comfortable if you all would agree if you would allow us to maybe pull it back and do some more research on this? Absolutely. Oh, yes, no problem. Absolutely. And, and, Thank you. And there's another, <laughs> sec there's another section that talks about um, if, if an IDD student is doing the cooperative work experience program, 
instead of saying they may be paid, if they're participating, if they must be paid. And I think we're maybe doing an injustice to IEP students who might be able to get work experience without pay, because that's they need to be able to get that, some of them, to be able to go out in the world and fund Yeah, I agree them. with you on that. Um, yeah, I do. There's I a do. lot of work programs that we have our kids go through yeah. that they don't get paid for, which yeah. is valuable experience for them. So, would the program in Adam Wire fall into this? They get paid. No, and it's part of the Flex pay. program. Yeah. yeah. But would it fall under that policy? It'd fall under the Flex program, which is in the next policy, next if policy. I'm not mistaken, IKF. But they, that part of that program is they're going to be, be paid. That's, so that's why it probably would right. affect the Adam Wire program. So, I have a question. Since this is not a like new law or a statute, just because Desi changed this, does that mean that every district has to follow that? If they, according to that, the information is put in the graduation requirements, if they want to count that towards a college credit and also a high school grade, high school credit, yeah. And I think there's even some talk about ADA in there. So, I, I, I That's a question appreciate y'all allowing us to pull that back. So basically, we're saying anything that is accredited that you're that we as a district are getting a grade for. Yeah, the we have to be providing that. Right. Yeah. And that's a concern. That's a <laughs> that's a concern. We have to pay that before I pay that. So what happens to people that have paid it? Well, well what about those people for 15, 20 years that have paid it? That's you know. Well, we don't want to highlight. We don't want to so I don't think we're going to go back off Well, but you think about the same time, Heather. The kids that take those classes out of CMO Sykeston, the, the, the cost per credit is so much cheaper it is. than it is if you're a, a full-time student. there's really value in it because, oh, right. because you utilize it at the college level. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I had, personally, two kids that graduated with we were, we were in the process of discussing with SEMO about allowing kids to get up to, wasn't it 42 hours? 42 credit hours, wow. yeah. If, All the basics, basically. But we kind of backed off a little bit and did this. What is it now? What's the maximum? Oh, they can, they can get, oh gosh, upper 20s. Upper 20s. Yeah, yeah, if you take everything that's offered. There's been a few students that have gotten more, but they didn't get no credit for it. You know what I'm saying? They, they, but those days are there that, that they're, they've got that time locked out in the day, so they would go take an extra psychology class or speech class or something like that. If the parents wanted to do that. That one has been removed. Very good. Do we need a motion for that? No, it's just, no, it's just no. It's Oh, yeah, I guess it's just consideration. And so this next one, we're going to have the same conversation because this is the graduation requirements that the other one refers to. Uh, as you can see down there. So this, it talks a little bit here about the American Civics exam that is now going to be mandatory. Uh, if you look there, the requirements, um, they have to have taken all the required ELC exams. And this is where the CPR is at. All students have to have had CPR instruction. I have a question on this too. I, I do too. <laughs> Um, number five, yes, where number it talks about, um, well, it's, it's talking all the way through here about when you waive, like, you know, the English credit and you take a, um, when you have the, the block class, oh, yeah. like a three hour, or mm -hmm. if you waive an English credit for the flex program, the flex, or, you know, whatever it, it talks about here. Um, it's, it's saying that. In the highlighted section, it says that the student must take the end of course exam required for any waived course. Yes. So if you're in a block of, let's say you're in mm -hmm. Brian Henson's class for three hours, and you've waived your English, yeah. you still have to take the EOC? Well, yes, but I will say that most of the EOC, that doesn't affect many kids because most of your EOCs that are required are your ninth and tenth grade years. Besides government, would you agree? So, like English two is taking your sophomore year. Most kids that are in those blocks didn't wait in their students. They would wait. Aren't they take it until their juniors. You know what I'm saying? So your older students are usually in those blocks. Um, 
So I would say very few students are. There might be algebra one that could fall in that. No, that would never be waived. Uh -uh. No. That would never be waived. I, I don't see that being. Yeah. So I don't think that'll affect very many, Heather. Okay. If any. But yes, that's what it says. That they really, that's a good opportunity for our kids to go ahead and get into a uh, block section and waive some of those yes. credits and then open up the door for some other class that they may want to take, whether it may be in some music class or some art class or something else, you know. It, it does credit. give them some opportunity for some flexibility because with our credits way though, there's not a lot of flexibility for our students. Any more questions on that, on those graduation requirements other than what we've already talked about? I guess we... Um, well, at the bottom, on just the page one kind of gives us the explanation. Page one, go back that we get from, from the MSBA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bottom paragraph says it's been added to the graduation requirement a statement that the student has taken all required in a course mm -hmm. exams, although not required by law or DESE, many districts prefer to include a requirement that the student has taken them. The district's free to remove this requirement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. But students, the end of course exam for high school students is counted as a semester final. Yeah. And with that, it's counted as Wait, a percent. Uh -huh. um, is it five or ten percent? Ten percent. Ten percent of your grade. Yeah. So it, 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 all finals in every class are weighted ten percent. And we just opted when we started the EOC because that's what it is. It's a comprehensive yeah. final of the class. So when they take that, they don't take a separate final. So, so is that a district thing that we're that we tackle and it's ten percent of your grade? Mm -hmm. Actually, actually, uh, it is suggested that it is a percentage of the grade. That's suggested by DSC again. Even they go as high as 20%. We even did it 20% a couple of years until we realized that it wasn't it wasn't advantageous to our kids or anything else. 10% is a pretty reasonable, pretty, pretty reasonable amount. And again, that's in all classes, just finals in general. If you have a finals in home and facts class, it's weighted 10% of your grade. So the you'll see is we just made that a final. Are we good with that one? Are we through with that one? Okay. One more. JCC. C. JCC. Uh, this is inter district tra inter district transfers. Uh, this is a new policy for our district. Uh, we've not had this previously, so this is not like an update or this is actually new. Um, in the past, it was supplemental. Some districts did have it, but it was uh, not all did. Basically, if you're a student in a uh, K through eight district. Uh, and there's no high school or students who reside in a district that's been determined uncredited, okay, then they can enroll in a district that is uh, an adjoining county and we have paid for That makes sense? Say it again. Okay. If, let's just say that, uh, and I'm not picking on Kelly, but okay. Kelly joins our county, doesn't it? Yes. Lines. So if, if there we have a student here and we are not accredited, something happens and our scores fall. To the fall. district or a building? District. Okay. District. Then they could say, I don't want my kid to, to go to the Saxon anymore, even though we live in that district. We're going to go to Kelly and we'd be responsible for that. Transportation. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's it. Well, that's what they ended up doing up in Normandy. I mean, that was a special case. But. In, inter, in the St. Louis City, they, yeah. that's what they do in inner city, but um, that's definitely new to us. So why would we adopt this if this is just for district consideration? How, well, can, that, how can that benefit our district by having this policy? I guess so that we're prepared so we're prepared that if it does ever occur we have it in place so that benefiting the student it, it is but it's not necessarily benefiting our district but you know we, 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 we would want our uh, our school buildings to all be accredited and looks like the game we're going to be this is kind of preparing for vouchers I mean yeah, I know. that's kind of where this is yeah that's where it's going didn't that legislation talk about the reimbursement or that 
they say go to yeah. Kelly, it's really only 90%. They don't get the 100%. That's exactly right. 10% yeah. yeah. of that would stay. Yeah, that's right. Just the eight, yeah, that's right. But the yeah, way the yeah, discussion is going, although it didn't proceed further this year, I would assume it's going to come back again next year the way anybody's talking. Thank you. Next, we have the FY18 budget overview. Ms. Boardman is going to present that information. That's what your, your little booklet is. I'm sorry. Well, that's okay. The, the good news is we're not going to cover everything in this book today. <laughs> <laughs> Are you glad? Um, the first year Heather was on the board, and she came in and did her first budget meeting, which is historically we wait for that very last week in June so we know everything there is on payrolls and we know everything there is on revenues. And then we present it, we have like three days to pass it. She went, I've got to vote on this tonight. And I was like, yeah, that's not a very good method of uh, presenting. So, especially this year, since we have three new board members, we wanted you to have something. I know we're supposed to be going paperless, but you can take this with you. Um, I will apologize, apparently they're really cheap folders. We put them together about 30 minutes before the meeting and I'm black. So don't hold it against any white dress shirt. Uh, but this is very, yeah, your hands are going to be black, like you're reading the newspaper. Um, this is very tentative. Keep in mind, I've not been in the district full time. Tom and I have had three or four phone conversations over this, but we've, been, we've got to sit down and have some serious powwows. And this is completely different from those of you that have been on the board than what I'd normally present, but this is just round one. So the expenditures are cut to the quick, and the revenues are the most optimistic scenario that you can present, which normally I do just the opposite. Normally, we do expenditures, assume that the sky's going to fall and we have to pay for it, and we assume we're not going to get any money. But we've done it a little bit differently. So what you basically have in here is a summary page, and you'll see it's subject to superintendent final review because we've got to sit down and basically go through the weeds on this. Uh, you'll see some of the things that are and aren't included in the box over to the side to get to that purchase services, supplies, equipment, and debt number. Uh, we will update on the June 26th meeting. By then, we will have run all of our payroll, so we'll give you a real number on salaries and benefits. I can tell you this is pretty close. Uh, revenues are subject to change when we see what we get final payment from DESE, which will be around the 20th or the 21st. There are some career and tech expenditures that I'm worried about getting some cuts. Big thing on the revenue side that we had no heads up on whatsoever was on Title I. Title II and Title VI-B, which apparently now is going to be 4A, uh, we've had $145,000 in cuts, and we had no heads up. Just open the allocation, $145,000 gone. So we have done some scrambling that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more uh, with some, this affected some hiring that we we're going to ask you to consider tonight. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, that's where we are, salaries, benefits, expenditures, again, best case scenario, the formula. You've seen, you know, all these articles start that the formula is fully funded and the legislatures are very proud of themselves. And then you get down in the, at the last paragraph and it says, and we caution you, uh, there will probably be withholdings. So there's a $200,000 swing on the formula money. Included in this number is the most optimistic where we actually get new money on the formula, which we haven't seen in years. Uh, Prop C, sales tax money, the same way. Here's the best case scenario. We might pay you $985 per weighted average daily attendance, but if you want to be conservative, you might go as low as 924. So, so those are in there. And we'll talk more about this on the 26th. I just wanted, again, especially since we have some new ones, uh, but if you look behind this, you have a detailed printout, and there's going to be typos because this is dumped from our um, our uh, finance program, so I'll just tell you up front, <coughs> you'll find plenty of typos in it. Um, you will see where the revenue projections are coming from. I do have some talking points over to the side if you can follow my logic. And then on the expenditure side of things, this is just every expenditure code we have that has a budget in it for 1718 dumped out there compared to 1617. Uh, again, not expecting you to get in the weeds. Feel free to, to write down any questions that you got, but we'll go through this line, <coughs> line by line on the 26th. 
if there's an increase in a if there's a big increase in a line item or a big decrease in a line item but revenue or expenditure side we'll take time to talk about that on the 26 but this is just a good starting point and there's some information down at the bottom of where we think we might end the year there's some information on some various race scenarios um, this does not have in it there's a line item, there's a holding place with a dollar in the expenditure side, but it does not have anything in it for the new building expenditures. We're gonna do that as a separate budget sheet. So, anyway, feel free, I'm back in the office full-time starting tomorrow, so you can get me on the phone, you can email me, and we'll be getting some more stuff out as we flesh this out a little once I've had time to sit down with Mr. Williams. So Lori, the federal funds, 145,000. Is that a guaranteed cut through the end of the Fed's fiscal year, or is there a chance that that money may come? I don't think so. I think it's just a flat-out cut. Um, is it part of, do you think it's part of the overall cut that, that they're doing? I think it's going to be the wave of the future. And what's it's not in start. here is we've not seen an allocation on special ed. I don't even think about what. Because this is Title one. 2A. 2A, we can control the cut a little bit because 2A, a lot of it is re we do professional development and um, it, it's not 100% tied to salaries. Lynn's Title I, with the exception of about $15,000 out of $1.2 million, is all people. Um, and Chuck's 6B, now 4A, is all salaries. That, and that's how we fund the big chunk of our alternative schools. So, you know, it's. It wasn't good news. It wasn't good news at all. So, but I think we'll, I, to, to answer your question, Scott, I think we'll just see more down the pipe. Any other questions? I'm sure you will after you kind of delve into that a little bit, walk through it. Have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next under informational is at the practical nurses graduation, which is June 29, 2017 at Kate First at uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, all are, are welcome to attend if you like. Uh, Chad has agreed to stand on the stage this year and present that uh, or shake their hand or whatever we're going to have Chad do, but he has agreed to do that. Uh, Part of it because his wife is graduating, which is <laughs> well. so that's, that's good. But like it's I said, ceremony. It, it is. It's a really cool ceremony. If you haven't ever come before, <clears throat> Becky, you've been there. Scott, you've been there. And I think I don't. Oh, everybody's new. But uh, it's a great ceremony. It's very nice. It's very well done, and it's it's really neat. It's really neat. And it's important that the board board members attend. It is. You don't have to have everybody in attendance, but. Some of the board because it is part of our program. Okay, lastly, under informational is that of the community bus tour, which is August 3rd, 2017. And Lynn, you want to fill the board in on yep. what we're doing sure with right. that? They all should have a colored uh, flyer in your uh, packet, just looks like this. It's from uh, teachers throughout our district about their experience doing this one of the last two years. This is their third year to do it. We'd love for you guys to come if you can, even come by for a little while. It can mean a lot to the to the staff. It's going to be our biggest and best year yet. We're going to meet at the field house. We're going to come back to uh, some refreshments. It could be a day like today where if you walk the streets for a while, uh, it might be a little too hot. But we're going to ride here the addition bus. Ride the addition bus with the rest of them. For the driver. <laughs> yeah. It's a good opportunity to, to see some people around town and say hi. Say hey, we're from school. We're excited about coming back. Unfortunately, I think we tend to celebrate the end of school sometimes more than we do the beginning. So we're going to try to shift the thinking a little bit and let all the kids know looking forward to them coming back. So anyway, just mark that on your calendar. It doesn't take very long. We're only out for an hour, hour and a half, something like that. Maybe not that long if we have enough people. We just want to go to as many parts of the community as we can. So uh, hope you can come. Are you going out tomorrow now? So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 We did last year. We went out there. Uh, I would encourage everyone if you do attend and join us. I wear shorts, something cool. I mean, seriously, it, it was hot, uh, pounding that pavement for a couple hours, but it was well worth it. We got an opportunity to see a lot of parents, a lot of kids. There was a lot of excitement involved, and it's a great idea that uh, that our uh, administrators have put together to do this. Okay, going into requirement action. I, I want to. 
something I forgot at the beginning. We need to move something off of consent and put it on um, required in action. The ratification of extra duty assignment report. I don't know if we need to put that in executive session or what, but I think can we this do that now that it's been us. approved. Yeah, I mean, you can move, you can move to amend your agenda. Again, I mean, what do you want to do? What do you want? Take the uh, extra duty assignment report that's been consent agenda item. I recommend that we put that into executive session. Is that your motion? Yeah, I'll second that. Okay. Motion and a second for further discussion. Okay, gotcha. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's number four D. Yeah. Four D. Yeah. Okay. Okay, going into required action, uh, request permission to schedule executive session to discuss personal matters immediately following this meeting. We need a motion and a second. Construction delivery method for the new elementary building, and this was discussed last Wednesday with Scott Fleming when he came up and did the presentation of our new drawings. Uh, he talked about the the CMR construction manager at risk, and basically the idea behind this is that the the individual or the company that is hired to do this is going to work on the front end and also during the project. So. They'd be working hand in hand with the architect in planning, in addition to being on the job as we actually construct the particular facility. Now, some things that we did discuss about that uh, last week was about the bidding process. And the construction manager can bid on the process, I guess, unless the board decides that they don't want them to bid on it. Uh, if they do bid on it, then it's the board's responsibility to take those bids and to evaluate them and come up with a, an award on that. Otherwise, the construction manager at risk is going to be responsible for that bidding process. Okay. Um, also discussed last time was the local preference. Uh, we would follow our procedure, administrative procedure, in doing that, uh, which is granted to those individuals. Uh, I can't, it's based upon cost and a certain percent that they would have reduced from the particular bid uh, price. Uh, as, as I was talking to Brian earlier on that, the thing that we would have to recognize if, if we go with, let's say that we have one that's not a local vendor and it's maybe higher, okay, or lower rather, and we decide to go with the local vendor and it may be higher, we're going to have to absorb that cost. It's going to have to go back into the guaranteed maximum price. So those are things that would have to be taken into consideration. John, how would that work if the um, if the construction manager was able to bid, and you said that he handled the bids? Would that and the board have, would we have to have a meeting to approve a bid? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah, it would have to be a board meeting in which we'd have to uh, approve that bid. So he would be taken out of that altogether if he is bidding on the particular item. Well, we're kind of doing that up front, though. Like we're approving all the bids and stuff. Like you don't really do it. That he bids it, it's all sealed bids, and he doesn't know. Yeah. No, he doesn't know. He doesn't know. He'll be bidding just like anybody. But I mean, if he was a part of that. Oh, yeah, we, we have, have to approve it. Absolutely yeah. right. Yes, yes. Right. yes right. you're yeah. right. Absolutely right. Yeah, well, he's out of the science building. We get to approve everything. Right. Well, the well, construction yeah. manager for him, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we, we had to bring all the bids to the, to the board. It was an oversight, but the but the construction manager actually sat down and, and conducted the bid meetings. Bid meetings themselves. Yes. They yes. just brought like they do now. Right. This is the bid for whatever. So is well, that how it would be now or not? Is this, is that how it would be this time? Or would we get I would, I would see that very similar to to what it was back in 2005. Right. Because because the statute still in place, Scott, what, what we run into, especially on the construction of a new building, is 
anything that exceeds fifteen thousand dollars, we've got to, regardless of what it is and what context it's under, we've got to bring it to the board for a vote. So the, the difference would be this time where the construction manager, this room filled up with guys bidding on the jobs, and the construction manager sat in Tom's seat and conducted it. If if they're actually going to bid on a portion of it, they have to come out here to this side, and, and you all have to sit up there and open the sealed bids and, and award that way. And then you would still have the opportunity then as they did subcontracting, you would approve those bids or change orders if some came about, you would do those. Well, and the we're construction not really deciding tonight whether or not we're going to allow them to bid on these, are we? We're just deciding no, whether or not no, we're going to no, we're, We have to, this according to state statute, is that we have to decide on this particular construction method. Right. Yes. And then I think what we can do is we can work with as far as how this process goes. Because first off, what we're going to have to do, it's a two-step process. Normally, everybody read through that information, through the statutes and all the information that Brian presented. But it's a two-step process. We have to look for, first put out an RFQ and, and get the qualifications of the particular construction manager. Just like we do with hiring the market. Exactly the same type of thing. You have criteria that you would rate that particular individual. Uh, from there, you would take the short list. You take uh, four or five individuals or companies. And then you would ask for RFPs as far as the cost of doing business with us and what their guaranteed maximum price would be. Tom, did you find out about the range of what the charge would be for the construction manager? Like the, what percentage? Yeah, what I found out from Jackson, I, I got a roundabout number, roundabout, roundabout percentage. It was said no more than 5% is what I found. Um, I would assume that in the negotiation phase is when we would discuss that and right. find out. We can always go, we didn't like the answer. Exactly. And at the we say, well, We're we going say to the like, next person right. on the list. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Absolutely. I think that's kind of a neat thing about that process is we don't like what we're hearing here. Well, we'll just go to the next one and, and go with them. So with the construction manager at risk, how do we, I mean, we have that guaranteed maximum pricing and then he, oversees the the bid process and how do we where do we fit as far as if we as a board want to assure our community that local people have opportunity to bid on those things. We could put that into the contract. Yeah. Yeah. Well yeah. we yeah. could put that into the contract as far as getting our local people involved with the building whatever trade that they may have, uh, we would like them to have the opportunity to build. And we can adopt a percentage that if the local vendor is within X amount of percent, percent then we would take that I mean, local bid. No way we've had that. Yeah, yeah, you've got a policy in effect yeah, yeah. that's already on the books, and my thought was, was going to be just to include that from the beginning in the RFQ, the RFP, and then in the final contract that we're going to have this we direct you to, we're going to go by this policy. Now, the difference is, and this was alluded to earlier, if there is a situation where there's a more expensive local option, that changes the guaranteed maximum by law. So, the yeah, which makes sense, is. whatever the difference is. I mean, if the board but decides... We're not, we're not held to even the lowest bid, like we talked about right. before. I mean, You're, we don't... You're not held to the lowest bid, yeah. even on the. That that's something that's always been curious to me about the local preference. It's kind of more of a policy statement than anything else, because even if it was five percent different, and you thought we need to go with this contractor because of quality, because of, because they're local for a variety of different reasons, you've had problems with the other, you know, the, yeah. the, the other contractor. You can still take. Them. You can still take them, but that would change the guaranteed maximum for the seat. Which makes sense. Can we exclude anybody from bidding? Or, I mean, if you know a contract that you've had nothing but trouble with? Or? I, I don't know the answer to that because you're a public entity that you want to exclude. If you, if you want to exclude, hey, say, say hey, we, we, I'm not aware of anybody like that either. But you know, there, there certainly could be. Um, I could, I'd be happy to look into that. But I don't know. I've never seen had that question poised me. Could we just exclude some subcontractor from any and all? It's a little different when you're a public entity as opposed yeah, to that point, just uh, allowing the bid. Yeah. But by virtue of what you said before, where you 
have the ability to say, well, we're, we're not going to take we're that gonna, we're not contractor take because we know of an experience in the past. So if that were to come up, you could deal with that. And we as a board, spaces. you know, were presented with this, we'd say, oh, that's not, we can't do, you know, we're not going to do that. Yeah, right. that because had bad history yeah. with us. They didn't finish the floor in the gym. Yeah. You just have to we did have that problem. <laughs> Is there any other questions on the CMR? Uh, it is my recommendation to consider that a construction manager at risk for this particular, as a delivery method, construction delivery method for the new elementary. One quick question regarding that. Do we do you anticipate? Uh, sort of like a subcommittee of three board members kind of doing the same thing with, that we did with the architect? I, I would assume because you're going to have to rate these individuals yeah. on a scale, on some type of rubric. Right. So I would assume that we will need to get a subcommittee as we did with the architect. Can we get the architect involved in that? I mean, I don't know how you all feel, but I think you ought to rate. I don't know if there's anything that excludes them from being yeah. there, but... We can I don't know that. A committee, so why couldn't we appoint our architect? I think you can. It's just whether he could certainly be in the meetings on the committee, and you could listen to his advice. Ultimately, the committee and ultimately the board obviously have the vote. Right. 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 You, can, you can, couldn't delegate the vote. I, mean, I don't think that's what you're talking about. But certainly, I think you want your architect involved. Yeah. Yeah. He could be involved up the phone. Yeah. Right. So that, I mean, have to come here. Yeah. Right. 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 Or by video or, or whatever yeah. methods. I mean, I think that makes. Sense. I'd move that we accept the administration's recommendation for the uh, construction manager at risk. Second. A motion and a second. Any further questions, discussions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Uh, Any opposed? All right. Next on the item on the required items list is consideration of approval of 2017-18 free and reduced lunch applications. Uh, this is a document provided annually by USDA and basically the bottom line is if we want to participate in the National School Lunch Program, this is the document that we have to use. Uh, if you had a chance to look at the attachment on BDOCS, you would see that in the letter to the parents, our um, meal prices that you uh, approved last month are put into that. And then basically it's just a form letter that's used throughout the nation. Uh, one change this year, um, and I've talked to the State Department, uh, they've added a step four on the actual application itself that says no completed form two. And we chose to put Board of Education Office 1002 Virginia Street because our um, printing group, Brian Henson, prints these for us and it's a huge cost savings and we didn't want him to have to run different batches. Uh, but we will follow the same procedure that we have in the past. I got approval from Bessie. We send these in our back to school packets so parents have time to fill them out and we ask and we'll ask in a separate cover letter that they bring it back to the building so we can get them approved in a timely manner but it's just a formality for you to adopt this so we can participate in national school lunch <coughs> recommendation to approve the free and reduced lunch application make a motion i'm going to receive it motion second second any discussion or questions all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Fourth item is consideration 2017-2018 a la carte pricing. Should we just say that? <laughs> uh, this is, we did not have this ready last month when you approved the mill prices. Uh, Hugh has had an opportunity to visit with his vendors on his pricing for next year. We increased everything on the list by a dime, which historically that's what we do. I will most likely come back to you in August with a reduced price on bottled water. That will play well into our um, wellness policy. And so he's working with vendors now. So we've got it approved now at what it is, and I'll come back in August with a price update when he gets his new vendor in. I move we approve the Arla Paula card pricing. Second. Motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. 
Consideration FY17 budget adjustment. <laughs> Thank you for this on purpose. He just put all my stuff on. Stand up. <laughs> uh, this is our annual year end. Uh, Lori gets paranoid about how the year is going to end cleanup. <laughs> so there is a state statute that says you cannot over um, spend in any one fund. And until we get our grant FERs, our final expenditure reports on our grants and shuffle things around and look for errors, there's always a possibility that you may have paid for something in fund one that should have been fund two or vice versa. And we usually figure that out about mm, midnight on June 30th and it's too late to have a board meeting. So I always request permission for just fund cleanup, just generic fund cleanup. It does not have an effect on the bottom line of the budget. It's just literally rotting near the paywall. Uh, the second that I'm requesting is a budget adjustment, and this is real similar. It's moving between salaries and benefit codes. We were going to have some excess in salary codes, and I needed to cover actual expenditures um, on the benefit side. Technically, we don't have to do that. The auditors like it. It helps us have a cleaner audit report to know that we are actually, we didn't just throw a budget out there last June and you all never looked at it. So it's basically just a cleanup. We need to move $140,000 from um, salaries, purchase services, and supply codes over to benefits, and mainly that's covering that 5% increase that we have on summer checks where the board uh, went up to 85%. And then exciting news, we sold our bonds on May the 31st. Um, so we will have some expenditures that we will pay out of this fiscal year. We will have standard and fours. Piper Jaffrey, Gilmore and Bell, uh, various people that worked with us on closings. I'm estimating about $100,000 in expenditures that we will have to pay out. Again, this probably wouldn't have been necessary, but I need clarification from Desi. And if it has to come out of Fund 3, we weren't going to have enough money budgeted in Fund 3. So we'll just go ahead and put that $100,000 in the budget. Once I get clarification for them, I'll assign it to a code. And then on the revenue side of things, the money's coming in. We get the money tomorrow, so it'll be in. It'll go into our account before noon tomorrow. Uh, the bonds did sell at a really good interest rate, so we are going to uh, show a premium on the bonds. Uh, we had forecasted that a no-tax increase would fund $8 million. It actually funded $8,348,597.60. So we're, we're starting the project $348,000. So. Very good. So basically, this is just cleanup. Your right. revenue adjustment and your bond expenditure will affect the bottom line. Everything else, bottom line, stays the same. How many entities purchased the bond? Just we one. just had one. Was it? Mm -hmm. Who was it? Who was it? I can't. Uh, it's Janie. 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 Montgomery. Janie. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Out Jane, or, uh, Janie or Janie or Pittsburgh or Philadelphia or somewhere. Now, I, I, they they sold people under them because they. <laughs> The last five minutes they put in and pulled out their bid several times, so that so they were they were on the phone. Wasn't there so five that were yes. bidding on that? Yes, they so. got yeah. it. Was uh, it was a little bit better than we thought too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So uh, two something. Two seventy five. Yeah, and they were looking around yeah, three. We, yeah, everything on the, it was the better than we. Had yeah, everything that we had projected with Piper Jeffrey was based on a three percent, and we came mm -hmm. in at two point. Just over 2.75. So that was good news. Good. Yeah. Market was very friendly that day. Recommendation to accept the FY17 budget adjustment. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Further discussion? Questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Or you can stand back up. Um, <laughs> we have the consideration of the, I got to come back to work. <laughs> consideration of the capital projects transfer. Okay, this again, annual event. Uh, we, we do a lot in June that we just do once a year. Uh, as the board is aware, we don't have a fund for capital projects levy. That's not something we put on our taxpayers' back. Um, so we just, all of our money goes into fund one, fund two, and then whatever we have in debt service to pay our debt. So in order to do any capital expenditures that are required by statute to be paid out of fund four, we have to move money over to that. One annual allowance that is allowed is, um, well, it's a long name, but anyway, basically it's 7% of your state adequacy target times your weighted average daily attendance. And again, like everything else with this, there's a big long formula. And they send you a list and says, here's what you can move. We do this every June. 
we ask that we be allowed to move up to the maximum amount and then when we get everything cleaned up we move what is feasible over from operating over to fund four um, the board committed uh, money to the building so it would be very important that we move those over now we had some uh, we moved a fairly large amount last year because we were able to do so so we already have a pretty healthy fund for so we'll be able to spread that to cover the building costs out over the next two years the resolution has to be in the minutes it has to state specifically what you're going to do and in this case any money we moved will be earmarked for the new building so this one was pretty cut and dry uh, the estimated amount according to the desi website that we can move this year is one million four hundred and forty seven thousand five hundred and twenty three dollars we won't move that max amount uh, and I will update the board. It may be July before I know for sure, but we will update on what we did move over. So how much do you feel like we'll need? I, mean, I think we would be fine even moving as little as six or 700,000 this year. Um, what I don't have a crystal ball is how much we would be able to move next year and what it would do. So I will move as much possible up to the max that won't be detrimental to what we need to do in operating next year. So could you move the maximum amount just in the event that we were to need it next year? If we didn't, could we? Can't move it back. You can't go back to operations. No, no, no nothing, nothing's that easy. <laughs> so, no, you can, once it's there, there's no way to move it back. So we have to be very, we have to really, you know, mind our P's and Q's when we, when we decide how much to move. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> well, we need a vote. We need a vote. Move to accept the resolution. Yes, please. Second. second. Motion and second. Further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion here. Next is the consideration of the office supply bid. You see that John Seiler has presented us with uh, bids from several different groups. Uh, the recommendation is to accept the bid 57 items from standard stationery $7,924 at one cent, eight items from Office Depot at $669.51, uh, 30 items from School Specialty, which is $896.27 for a total of $9,489.79. My recommendation to accept those bids. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next, we have the consideration of the construction paper bid, and the recommendation given to us by John Seiler is to accept the bid from School Specialty for $2,593. And fifty-five cents. Got a question about that. The, the three thousand minimum was that just with standards stationaries bid, or was that on on all of it? No, that was just the standard stationary. It's just standard. Okay. Um, I move we accept it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Second. Motion and a second for the discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Any opposed? Okay. Consideration of facility rental rates pursuant to policy KG. This is something that we have to do on an annual basis. Uh, this particular chart here that you have within your packet is something that was developed back in 2004, I believe it was, 2005, somewhere there. Uh, but it is my recommendation to continue and to utilize the the, the uh, prices that we have already established. So no price change. And if we accept the facility rental rates as shown. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. Consideration of A plus candidates. Uh, this is a list in front of you here of all of the students that are eligible to receive benefits from the A-plus scholarship program. So it's my recommendation that we accept those. I make a motion that we accept those students. Second. Motion and a second. Any 
motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. Question. Back on that. that kind of relates to that. I'm just curious how many, we've got 52 kids here, how many were going off campus and taking advantage of that? They had to qualify under A plus. Do you have all that lunch for you? Yeah. To go, what to go off campus for their lunch. <laughs> I don't know. I found that. Do you know I anybody would say, do that? I would say a lot of those kids that were involved in A plus. I guess, I guess where I'm at with it, I'm just wondering how many of those kids are doing it just to go off campus versus actually completing the A plus. But I think Scott, I think there there has <laughs> been going on for years as far as the kids completing this simply because. Not necessarily that they use it, although they can use it, and it's a great program. I think a lot of times they utilize this for uh, as far as placing it on the resume, or they may also, can they not double up and use those for service learning hours? Yes. yes. I, I, so, I will, I will comment on that. I, I, I haven't been A-plus coordinator for five years, but it's really close. It was average around 30 to 35, so we've increased. I oh, think, definitely. Yeah, I realize I that. The, I think the lunch off-campus lunch has increased our A+. Plus. Just like adding that teaching has increased our, our A+. Plus <coughs> candidates. Do you think they want to go off-campus for lunch? <laughs> yeah. I think so. If that answers your question, uh, now how many of they can use it to go into college? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, a little bit of luck. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Shannon, if you wouldn't care to check yeah. into that, I appreciate it. Well, I'm writing down 10 things on my agenda to get up to date. I'm yeah, behind, okay? I'm saying, Thank you for helping me out. Sure. Don't yeah. vote on it then. <laughs> okay, next we have a consideration of naming of the new elementary facility. And this is something that was brought up last month. Um, Kyle had discussed it. Uh, I had a conversation with Scott Matthews, and I think Kyle had also. That, that Scott had, had requested that the board consider naming of the new elementary building, that of Wing Elementary. Uh, and so it's my recommendation to the board that we name the new building Wing Elementary. Move we accept that motion. Motion and a second on the floor. Any discussion, questions, or comments? All, right. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? I agree. <coughs> I agree. I agree. I agree. Agree. Yeah. You know, one thing we I know we've got a sign out there, but at some point we may want to put a future home you know, wing elementary. Or something. You know, the why are that so far down that sign? Why is it so far to the south or the no, no the east? East. east. Uh, I don't really know because I think the original intent <laughs> was to put it right there in the corner. The corner. Yeah. And I think they had moved it. They put it out there and then they moved it down to that spot. Uh, the intent originally was to change the sign periodically, you know, uh, coming soon or whatever. So we could most certainly put some type of new yeah. sign out there and put it in the corner well, so that everybody can see. Will you contact Scott? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. I will. I think that we should consider maybe doing some kind of like a newspaper article or something about the naming of the Funny thing that you should say that because tomorrow I'm going to have a conversation with the and Good. we're going to talk about that. Okay, next we have a consideration of physical and occupational therapy services. Mr. Crater. Folks, we had one bid, so we're going to recommend the bid we have, but it's the same group um, we've used for the past several years to provide our physical and occupational therapy to Senior Rogers Children's Center. And the good news is their uh, rates have been um, consistent. They've had a few an increase the time that I've been here, so. You know, pretty good working relationship with them, so my recommendation is to be bid. I move we approve the bid. Special education services. Second. Physical occupation therapy. Well, I don't want you to do that. Okay. Okay. Just make sure. Sure. Okay. Motion and a second on the floor. Next item is the approval of paid bills through May of 2017. It's my recommendation to accept those and 
we'll just do a roll call. So moved. Yes. Mr. Epstein. Mr. Boyce. Yes. Mr. Lee. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Two abstentions. Okay. Next, we have the consideration of board policy GBL, which is that of personnel records. And that is that correct, Heather? Yes. My question on this was where it talks about confidentiality. It says that um, the district creates and maintains personnel records for district purposes and in general personnel records will only be available to district employees or independent contractors who are authorized by the district to access the information. I just want a clarification of what would it be, who would an independent contractor be that would have access to that information? Actually, if you go down further, I think that issue is, is dealt with a little later with the district's legal counsel. Is that the only person that would fall under that? I'm not aware of any. I don't know of anybody else that we would we would give that information to. I'm not aware of anybody personally. There may be. Uh, Mr. Williams, can, can I yes, speak to this? Uh, in a case where you used a third party payroll system, in our case we don't. Um, Cheryl does ours in house. Uh, but a lot of school districts actually do a third party that you send, you know, your time card information out to them and they process it. Uh, so they would have access to personnel records in that case. Uh, that would be the one, the one instance I could think of. What about like insurance? That's what I would yeah. yeah. But it says, it says independent contractors who are authorized by the district. Chad, yeah, I wouldn't think that they would have access. The only other scenario I can think of is um, that yellow folder group that has tried to get us to do business with yes. us for several years. Yes. They are a company that comes in and actually um, they scan your personnel records and they send them off to some big vault under the ground in Colorado so your stuff is safe and charge a lot of money to do that. And a, and a lot of school districts, I mean, we have a record center and it, it's full, but we're not a St. Louis public schools where they have millions of records that they have to maintain. So you would, uh, that's getting more and more popular where you're giving them access and then you only utilize or only access your personal records via their electronic system. So I would think that was covering that as well. But we don't have any situation where a third party has access to ours. That was my question. I, I just wanted to clarify that because it does, does state in addition to good district's legal counsel and then state and federal agencies. I just wanted to know who, who exactly would that be. So that was my that was my only question on that. It's recommendation to accept work policy uh, GBL. Why do we accept? Everybody rushing. We're all, <laughs> all right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next is a consideration of board policy JO, student records, K through 12 districts. On this one at the bottom or on page, what I'm looking at, page five, mm -hmm. it talks about military and higher education access. And in the highlighted area, it says, however, it's talking about the district will disclose the names, addresses, telephone numbers of secondary school students to military recruiters or institutions of higher education as required by law. However, if a parent or a secondary school student who is at least 18 submits a written request, the district will not release the information without first obtaining written consent from the parent or the student. Um, and then the district will notify parents and secondary school students who are at least 18 that they may opt out of these disclosures. Um, I want clarification that, so for a parent to opt out that you do not want your child's information given to a military recruiter, they have to be at least 18? No. no. Uh, first off, you notice in the beginning, and the right at the front of your back to school, yes, yeah, your handbooks, thank you for helping me. There is a statement in there that you can opt your child's name from going out to any of that type of right. stuff. Okay, what it's saying here, the way I interpret this, once you become 18, if you 
then you right. have that opportunity to do that yourself. But it says, the language says, though, that if a parent or secondary school student who is at least 18. Well, it's, they're acting on their own behalf rather than the yeah. parents acting I, 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 I see what you're saying, but I took the change, and I don't, I, I took the change to mean it's the parent's choice if the child's under 18, and when the child is 18, it's, their choice. it's, it's, the, it's the adult, the new, the young adult's choice, because they're, and I, I don't want to get too much into statutory construction, but I think they're, we would need a comma before, you know, you, you, the 18, at least 18 modifies the student language, the secondary school student. Because there's a comma before and a comma after. I know I'm splitting here. But that, and, and, and that's the change. If you look above that, the part that's crossed out, it just dealt with dealing with the parents. And I think the change is to allow people who are 18 to make their own decision. And I hope I answered your question. Well, okay. But I'm, I'm just saying it says, however, if a parent or a secondary school student who is at least 18. Right. So that's still giving the parent the opportunity to opt them out. Mm -hmm. Not a third over 18. Or a student who is at least Or 18. a student who is at least 18 can do mm -hmm. that, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. e e so I can still opt my child out even though they're not 18. Right. Yes. But once they're yes. 18, they can, they can do it right. themselves. Yes, they can do it or themselves. you can still do it for them. Or you can still right. do it for right. them, or okay. they can say, I just want to clarify want to that, that. that it wasn't saying that the parent or that you had to be 18 before a parent could opt you out or oh, no, yourself. No. All right, good. No, I'm good. Yep. Recommendation to accept board policy J.O. Make a motion we accept J.O. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. I turn it over to you. Oh. So I, I believe, yes, that's all we have. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll get a few breath here. Let's go over the consent agenda items. <clears throat> are the approval of minutes from the executive session May, 2000, May 2nd, 2017, work session May 9th, 2017, regular session May 9th, 2017, executive session May 9th, 2017, executive session May 25th, 2017, ratification of substitute teacher report, ratification of support staff report, skipping D. Um, Acceptance of the of employee resignation from Laura Johnson and Kelly Bright. Is that Deanne? Deanna? Deanna Dow. Deanna Dow. Approval of uh, board policies as proposed by MSBA. Yeah. Uh, DDE, GDLB, GCPD, JCB, JFCL, and as proposed with, uh, by the MSBA with a local amendment, GDPE. Approval of the uh, following 2017-2018 handbooks, SCTC Adult Student Handbook, Library and Media Services Handbook, Health Services Handbook, Practical Nursing Student and Clinical, ha clinical Handbooks, Substitute Teacher Handbook, Sale of Surplus Property Pursuant to Policy DMAP Technology, Sale of Surplus Property Pursuant to Policy DMAP Transportation. I don't know where to ask this, but uh, the substitute teacher report, the one that's listed is no longer even in our district, is moved to a... I'm sorry, Jim. The, uh, the substitute teacher report, that individual has moved out of our district and has taken a job. They're now in Nebraska. Benjamin Moore? I'm sorry. Well, actually, it, well, it may be, depending on which one that is, I'll look loosely there. So. They can still be on the list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's just, yeah. it's just approving them, yeah. Yeah. But there may be a different, yeah. I'll address that. I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent <laughs> agenda items. I'll second. Any questions or further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And uh, I will also entertain the motion to adjourn. And we adjourn into executive session. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye.
Uh, any opposed? Because we have, we have to make a comment.